Hey everybody, it's Alexander Williamson here with the secret history living in your aquarium on the Aquatic Morning Show, usually. So, if you're watching this segment on my channel, it means you're either a member or you're getting a sneak peek at what these little segments are about. But usually, I do these every day of the week that they have the Aquatic Morning Show on, and I read an interesting fact, story, trivia, or just some cool fish news out of scholarly journals or out of the fish keeping world uh, and share it with you guys. Maybe it's something that happened this day in history, maybe it's uh, some new discovery, new species, or new science. And today is no exception. We have an interesting study that was just published and made uh, public, obviously it was published, uh, and this study is about the behavior of fish whether they fight, flight, or freeze. So just like humans have a panic response of fight or flight, so do fish, apparently. And it runs in their families. Who would have thunk it? So let me go through this and tell you a little bit more about it. University of Exeter scientists examined Trinidadian guppies, and they reacted how they responded to stress. Did they freeze or did they flee? They also measured the hormone response in their body by measuring it in the water. So the study found that some fish tended to produce a hormone that we know as cortisol, which is the same hormone humans produce for stress, and these fish are more likely to flee while the other fish who produce less cortisol tend to freeze and or play dead or stay still. This pattern, however, they've found, runs genetically in the families of fish, not in their taxonomy family, but in their mom and dad and baby fish family. So, it makes us think that there may be a way to actually breed this trait into our fish. So, in the wild, an instinct to flee can help a fish escape from danger, and a rush of cortisol actually helps them cope with the stress of that. Um, Dr. Tom Housley of the Center for Ecology and Conservation at the uh, Exeter's Penray campus of Cornwall in the UK had this to say, which was, uh, but in captivity, this reaction is unhelpful. A chronic high cortisol stress response is harmful to the fish and the welfare of the creature. Our finding of a genetic link between the hormone response of cortisols and the behavioral response is large. Reactions suggest that fish could be selected for based exclusively on their freeze or flee response. By selecting fish that tend to freeze in a stressful situation, you would create a, genetically, a genetic stock with a lower cortisol stress response overall. So you wouldn't have fish that are getting sicker easier. Uh, so this approach is simpler than other breeding methods because some of them depend on uh, blood sampling and other things to, genetic, to, to identify genetics. However, now we can also lean on behavior, and we didn't know that before this study. So before this study, this is the first study that has linked behavior to genetics of a family in fish. So now we can actually identify personality traits in fish, some of which are detectable in the amount of adrenaline, cortisol, uh, testosterone, estrogen, whatever it may be, so these chemical uh, endocrine system chemicals, and we may be able to then figure out their lineages within their groups by just looking at that, which is kind of cool for uh, behavioral biology. At the same time, they're more interested in this for its practical purposes. So Professor Alistair Wilson from the CEC at University of Exeter had this to say, which was, individuals and groups of close genetic relatives obviously vary. And by taking account of this, we can selectively breed captive fish with the lowest stress response and hormone output, in the end bringing them better health. So biologists have long believed that the integration of the, the behavioral and the hormonal response must exist, but no formal genetic studies or tests had really been carried out where they could show that. 
In this study, a team, including the University of Alabama-funded Biotechnology and Biological Sciences Research Council, now there is a long name, the BBSRC of Alabama, uh, they tested the hormonal reactions in a second test, just to make sure, and they tested uh, fancy guppies by placing indi individual guppies in isolation for an hour. So instead of scaring them, uh, for a social fish like a guppy, handling the isolation is likely to produce a mild amount of stress. However, it's kind of a tipping point. So during a stress response, elevated cortisol levels help the fish shift their body's energy balance. It increases their metabolism. It speeds it up. And it also helps them recover from stressors, which aids their body in preventing disease as well. Cortisol is definitely a necessary part of coping with stress, and it's found in all animals across the spectrum, but if it's used too frequently and in too large of amounts within the body, cortisol leaks out through the guppy's gills and can be sensed in the water. And when it's in amounts that are measurable in the water and that are in high amounts for these fish, it really starts to do damage to their health. The behavior was tested separately also by placing each guppy in a new tank and seeing whether they tended to stay still, as in freeze, or swim around trying to escape through a system of gates and kind of like a little maze they set up. Hundreds of the fish were observed in the study and researchers looked at their family trees to see how they were each related to one another. They had about four generations of fish and they found that the genetic relatedness perfectly correlated with the hormonal output of cortisol in these fish. So it means we can breed these fish. So for aquaculture and for uh, food sources as well as aquarium sources, or maybe just breeding at home, if you notice that a fish freezes when it's scared, when the glass is tapped on, if all the other ones flee and maybe a couple of them just kind of chill and you know that they're um, healthy in every other way, this is kind of highlighting that they're just like people in the sense that some get scared very easily, others don't. Some have panic attacks, some have depression, some have uh, generalized always a little more stressed. And the cool thing about this study is that we can, with fish, select for those things and reduce that stress. And in guppies, live bears, and a lot of other fish, that means reducing the amount of cases of ick that they get, reducing bloating or dropsy, Popeye, and all sorts of other things because their stress and their heart rate and their um, heart, their blood pressure, as well as their breathing and all these other things, their diet, their metabolism are all so incredibly intertwined with their immune system and their slime coat and their internal immune system. And so if we can keep the cortisol levels down until they're needed, which the body has a number of functions that will use them in all species, but in these fish as well. So they do need to have some, we can't just breed zombies, obviously, that wouldn't be fun to watch anyways, but um, we can select for fish that are less scared, which is better for the fish, and it's literally better for their health, which is better for profits, better for breeding outcomes, and so forth. So what do you guys think about this? Are we just going to end up probably taking it to the max and breeding fish that just sit there uh, that are feeder fish? Or uh, do you think that, um, you know, fish that you can pet or whatever? <laughs> or do you think that this is a good thing and it is something we should fiddle with? As always, this is Alex with The Secret History, Living in Your Aquarium. You can check out my channel with that name. Uh, but this is a segment on the Aquatic Morning Show, obviously. So I'm going to hand it back to you, Jess. Talk to you later, guys. Bye. Hey guys, it's Alexander Williamson with The Secret History, living in your aquarium on the Aquatic Morning Show. So, today I'm going to talk more about hormones, because we have all sorts of research coming out about fish, humans, and hormones. Turns out that estrogen plays a giant role in the development of our sense of smell. So this study all started with zebrafish at a school in Japan, a university in Japan, of course, and it turns out that the first cell to interact with the cluster of glial cells 
that become your oral factory cells or your sense of smell and later also uh, part of your sense of taste. And for reptiles and fish, also other things like uh, the Jacobson's organ and so forth. Um, basically, any sort of um, non-visual sensory input uh, from our mouth and nose, uh, it is mapped out through these same cells in the brain. So it turns out that estrogen is the very first uh, molecule, compound, or chemical in the body that activates those cells to start growing and that interacts with them. So estrogen, in fact, actually decides how well you'll be able to smell in later life. And the amount of estrogen also determines basically the development of those cells that then become the sensors in our nose. And bringing it back to fish, this whole thing was done on the zebrafish. So they genetically mutated some zebrafish to not have a sense of smell and others to have a sense of smell. And then they watched what the estrogen levels did in their brains basically so they monitored that and i'm sorry to say they needed to do uh dissection vivisection whatever you want to call it uh in order to find this out and they did biopsies on the tissue and they found that other than calcium uh which it, which helps uh basically electrical signals potassium calcium uh help ions and electrons go across nerve cells to conduct signaling, they found that estrogen was wedged in there when the fish were in their embryonic stage. So they cut open these little fish embryos and they found that estrogen was responsible for developing that whole part of their sense of smell and the nerve leading into the brain and the part of the brain that then processes that. So then they looked at mice. Then they looked at uh, primates, and now they're going to start looking at some of the implications for humans. However, fish have been really, really uh, dealt a bad hand in this uh, case because estrogen is one of the things in a lot of water sources. So because humans take birth control all around the world the last 50 years, estrogen goes way up in in its uh, amounts in the environment the ambient amount of estrogen is something like 50 times its its uh its proper or uh baseline amount when you're uh within a hundred miles of a city so that's pretty crazy that when they sample creeks and things uh the water just over time and things uh from municipal sources but also it just doesn't break down that quick and so it gets cir circled and cycled around and uh, this is having some sort of impact clearly on fish development and they're wondering if it could have any impact on things like for instance uh, if salmon are using sense of smell to find their original streams and creeks along with geomagnetic uh, sensory organs of some sort or if uh, sharks and other fish are losing their ability to hone in on prey because they don't have the smeller that's working properly. So it's kind of interesting, uh, catfish and some of the other fish that have more um, sensor array stuff like uh, barbels and whiskers, onodontodes, uh, that help them map things and taste things even. It hasn't been studied yet and it's not clear whether it, the estrogen also impacts those systems. But I'd be really curious because catfish can taste with their skin. They have over a thousand taste buds on their lateral line and as well as on uh, just underneath their fins, uh, pretty much all around their body at the start of the fins. So I'd be really curious to see if it's impacting that as well. And if it is, I mean, is that meaning that catfish may not be able to eat as well in murky water and so forth if they can't smell their food, their prey, their rotting, stinky garbage or whatever it is catfish eat? Uh, so, just food for thought, and uh, I'll smell you guys later. Bye. Hey everybody, this is Alexander Williamson again with The Secret History Living in Your Aquarium. Today we're going to be talking about probably one of the things that annoys all of us heavily about keeping aquariums from time to time, and that's algae. So it turns out that algae as we already know, consumes a lot of CO2. It is, after all, a photosynthetic life form, and it can get pretty dense. 
you've seen the thick layers it can produce. If you've ever had floating plants or let some plants float and let a high powered light grow on it in a tank with some nitrates and some nutrients in there, you can get thick mats, I mean like this thick, of just that green slimy algae. And that's all making, t taking in CO2 and making oxygen and using the energy to grow. Well, it turns out that the other cool thing you can do with that algae other than, well, eat it, because some of the algae actually is upwards of 50% protein, uh, a lot of the algae is also really high in fiber, uh, high in other vitamins and minerals, and it can be used as additives to food stock for other life, uh, such as farm animals and agricultural stuff, and it can be added into human food too depending on uh, taste and palate and how much is added. Now, that's pretty cool, but the other cool thing about it is you can actually turn it into an oil that can be burned, and it burns really, really pure. And uh, it burns very, very hot also, similar to like an ethanol. And then you are left with a tarry substance that is mostly just carbon, and that carbon can then be recycled into other things like graphite or who knows what, whatever they want to use it for, honestly. And the world at large has been figuring out what to do about climate change or at least CO2 uh, emissions. And it turns out that a lot of the Midwest has already been growing corn and taking that corn and making ethanol. Now, there are upsides and downsides to this that are way too long to get into in this video. But one of the things that happens when you ferment corn is only one third of the corn is actually uh, energy that's useful. Uh, another one third of it is left in the mash that either gets tossed or put into agricultural foods but not digested and so then it's left out in, it's not digestible by like cattle or pigs and things that it gets fed to oftentimes, whereas the algae is. So it just gets put into the soil, which is not a terrible place for it to go. However, when you grow the corn, the sort of pumps, electricity, coal-fired power plants, and the tractors and the transportation and all that kind of stuff with the corn takes another one-third and displaces that carbon like it was never even sucked out of the air. Uh, since we move it so much and it's heavy and it's also it's not the way it naturally was it's been genetically modified by humans for thousands of years and over the last 500 years it's really been tweaked into these things where you get these big old you know cobs of corn that are sweet and juicy and whatnot and there's there's other types of corn that are grown for different uses but I mean corn used to be a small little little grain you know uh, like wheat or something that was basically selectively bred to be huge so it doesn't it doesn't uh, metabolize things optimally in this way. There are a lot of sugars and other things that it creates in the process of making uh, that oxygen into CO2. Well, now they're finding that they can take that CO2 and offset it from the fermentation. So when it's putting out CO2 in that fermentation, they can then harness that and feed it to algae in these big pipes and they zigzag these pipes like a radiator in open fields and they found that throughout most of the United States Midwestern states which happens to be where we grow most of the corn uh, that they can actually put those at the ethanol plants and grow uh, the corn and then they can get a third back because it's so uh, it's so efficient in, in the way algae harnesses it. It's, it's usually a single cell organism or a network of singular cells in a chain or whatnot, uh, depending on which algae they use. And they're constantly tweaking different types of algae, trying different new algaes and whatnot. But the, the exciting news is that the algae is then eating the CO2, turning it back into oxygen, which is clean for the atmosphere, which is good. And then the carbon is helping the algae grow and every day in these systems they can then pull out which right now are mostly prototype size they're then able to pull out the the algae dry it or compress it in a hydraulic press 
and then turn that into this oily substance, which can also be a fuel that's actually more eff more effective at burning than the ethanol even. It's, it's almost like a petroleum product. So uh, it's pretty cool. You can produce a lot of heat and then maybe even run power plants and things off this. They're even thinking about making a form of synthetic coal out of plankton because after all, coal was made from basically swamp plants and teeny animals and things and algae and pond scum and you know any sort of bacteria and fungi and stuff that lived in uh, pre uh, well about 350 million years ago and longer back swamps and it actually converted that into uh, into what we think today of uh, coal and oil and tar and all these different things it just depends on how it was pressed how hot how long and what the vegetation was that was preserved long story short is they're going to actually try funding this a few different companies are getting into it and they're going to set up areas the size of football fields uh, that are 10 feet tall racks and they're all in a line and they get the sun even on a cloudy day they get the sun enough that they can grow particular types of algae and they can keep different types of algae rotating through on a 10 to 20 day basis and blooming it by switching out what's best for the temperature the light you know in the winter certain things flourish and in the in the summer other things flourish and they can selectively do that and optimize the energy so it's pretty cool that the uh, stuff that gives us a headache in our tanks has some potential to both clean up the atmosphere and create uh, a really new and innovative fuel source uh, that kind of helps fix some of the issues with corn. But corn has a huge lobbyist group in the United States, and it is big, big, big business uh, ethanol from corn. So uh, it's definitely going to be a politicized issue, and you'll have to do your own research. So uh, I recommend it. All right, guys, back to you at the Aquatic Morning Show. I hope uh, you guys are doing great and having a good one. Bye. Hey guys, it's me, Alexander Williamson again, with the secret history living in your aquarium. So, today we're going to be talking about some really interesting news out of Norway. And this has to do with the subject that, you know, I'm not totally uh, pleased by. I have a couple issues with this whole system, which is farm-raised salmon in the Atlantic. Uh, I think uh, there are some potential issues with it, definitely, but uh, that is beside the point of this video. This video is going to go over some really cool research that was done into a problem that they were having when they were captively breeding salmon. So when they're small salmon, when they're little fingerling salmons, uh, they don't use a pen out in a open area, like in, in the open salt water or in an open lake. They actually use aquariums, and they pump in fresh water usually from the ocean that's nearby. It's usually in a coastal region. And so a research firm and a company that farms salmon did a bunch of work with the uh, Fish and Wildlife Department, essentially, of Norway. And they wanted to figure out why their salmon were getting so many infections, things like, uh, not exactly ick, but things like ick, things like worms, things like parasites, and uh, just, you know, um, ammonia burns, things like that. And it, and it turned out that, you know, a big fish that's muscular like that really does produce quite a bit of waste and it uses a lot of energy and it gets fed a lot but doesn't always eat all the food and so even though they've got good filtration with bio filtration just like we do in our aquariums and lots of mechanical filtration and these power heads and these big circular tanks that allow the fish to swim consistently uh, in a big circle basically all day long and get their exercise and whatnot they still were having problems with ammonia nitrite and nitrates building up in the aquariums and other than just going through a massive amount of water doing water changes all day and dumping that back into the ocean and whatnot especially in Norway they have regulations that say how much they can use for each step of the process the adults they can have in pens or they can have in other types of systems where they're flushing out more water however 
the little fry that when they're growing out, the alvins, they're not allowed to be out in the open. Plus, they're also being farmed, and due to laws there, they're not supposed to be out in the wild competing with the fry of other fish, and just also you don't want them to get eaten if you're raising them for food. So they grow them in farms. But to control that issue of waterborne pathogens uh, without negatively affecting the fish or the biological bacteria is super challenging and uh, especially cold water species and so strategies applied through the inflow systems are usually not apl applicable for these self-controlled systems because nothing clears the water out and these are called RAS systems which just means that they are uh, in circulation within a loop and just like our aquariums they use the same water throughout the day it goes through a filtration sump essentially and then returns and so when you hear the acronym RAS it just means aquarium basically and it's a, 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 a term in Norway uh, in the fish industry that uh, doesn't quite translate right but uh, it's like recirculatory auto systematic or something uh, that they use throughout Europe, and it, it, so it's a term in the industry. So just pretend RAS Aquarium. All right, let's continue. So there are a um, a lot of different things that happen when you use so much water, and so they try to use less of it. They try to not throw away so much of the water um, and throw any sort of chemicals or any food byproducts that are not natural to the local ecosystems, especially near the shore. So over time, the accumulation of these substances in the RAS system, such as dissolved solids, ammonia, uh, and other uh, food byproducts, impose restrictions to how efficient uh, the disinfection of these uh, systems can be. And that leads to illness, to damaged um, skin and bio coats, the, the bio slime or the biofilm on the fish, and specific bacteria that convert that, uh, the, the nitrifying bacteria that converts the ammonia into nitrates is also impacted by certain pathogens that get in when they're constantly importing uh, water through pipes because when they do their water change, they're using actual salt water from the ocean nearby. So they've been trying to figure out how to use a disinfection solution developed for these RAS systems and categorized um, in two ways, either periodic or continuous water disinfection. And they use ozone or O3 and UV light um, on these higher flow versions of this consistently. So that's always killing some of the bacteria and algae and all that. And that helps reduce things. However, uh, in this application, they're trying to figure out what they can do to clean the systems and things while these fish are in there so they don't have to shut things down, they don't have to scrub everything clean, you know, gravel vac or whatever. And uh, they also can't get the ozone too high or it can cause fish, it can cause issues with the fish. So they've been looking for a chemical formula uh, and they've been trying to find some sort of compound that can work to disinfect these pens and they've tried a lot of different things they've tried copper sulfate chlorine chloramine chloramine t hydro hydrogen hydrogen peroxide uh, various hydrogen peroxide compounds formal formalin and uh, now they have tried parasitic acid and there is a high regard for this parasitic acid and its related byproducts uh, in the disinfectant world of, of this farm industry because it has an extremely low rate of bioaccumulation and it has, so far that they can tell, almost no impact on the fish in, in levels below a certain amount, which is something like six milligrams per liter. And uh, it wasn't known, so they did a study on how high they could take these levels and what the effects were when they put these these fish in a completely uh, non-moving stagnant uh, static system and they wanted to see what would happen with their uh, behavior their appetite and any alterations to uh, their gills their organs their skin their slime coat so the fish were exposed to 
uh, the target PAA uh, concentration in static system for one hour and the exposure exposure protocol was repeated after a 52 hour recovery period where the fish were allowed to go back to their normal ocean water doses of um, six milligrams per per uh, or 1.6 milligrams per uh, liter were added to the water and whereas uh, nothing seemed to happen at that level at the level of 3.2 milligrams they started to seeing a, see a little more gasping and as well as inflammation in the gills after they'd done this continuously for days so 3.2 uh, milligrams per liter was kind of set as their don't do that ever that's too high but they decided even though they could go to 2 or 2.5 they decided on 1.6 uh, as the safe limit for these fish and so rather than hydrogen peroxide or bleach or any of these more corrosive or um, I guess damaging things that cause necrotic gill uh, lamellas and uh, other issues that like uh, sores and liver and kidney failure as well as bioaccumulate in these fish which are going to be eaten they've found that uh, they use this acid and they are able to disinfect all the parasites that they've come into contact with in their system. Now, this isn't saying it would work for all indoor aquariums uh, of tropical uh, type, and they also know that it can interfere with pH and water with uh, low alkalinity, kind of, you know, low, like TDS, uh, neutral type water, uh, and so they did a study and they've been doing a study on the long-term exposure of this uh, parasitic acid to the fish. And so far, two years in, and they haven't found any damaging effects. So that's really good news and it's kind of exciting in that maybe in our hobby there are some uses for this parasitic acid. Uh, maybe we uh, could do something with that. So, no, this is a bit more long-winded uh, of a story, but I just thought it was kind of cool that maybe there is a new disinfectant in town that can do more good, and we know that because it's food grade uh, and it's getting dumped out into the ocean again, uh, it's really going through a lot more rigors than definitely anything you'd buy at Petco, PetSmart, you know, any store, and dump into your tank as a chemical which oftentimes we do because it's a quick fix, but it's not always the safest or most uh, environmentally sound solution. So now we ha have a new one. Thanks for tuning in, guys, and I'll hand it back to the Aquatic Morning Show. Take it easy. Bye.